What do you think about the Trump tax cuts in relation to the budget deficit? Well, the static estimate over the next 10 years is a little over a trillion dollars. I think the static estimate is an overestimate. I think uh, that we're going to get enough growth out of it to recoup a sizable fraction, whether it's all or half or 60% or something is hard to predict, but my view is that it'll recoup a sizable fraction of that. But that the main thing is it's helping the economy. You can't have the only uh, metric of a fiscal change be the effect on the budget. You could have something that helps the budget a lot that harms the economy and people's private incomes a lot. That's not a good idea. And you could have something that has a modest, potentially modest negative effect that helps the economy a lot and generates a lot more private income. Since on average, the federal government's taking about 20% of GDP, taxes are below that, it's spending around 20% of GDP in round numbers. Um, you know, if, if incomes have to rise, if we, want, if we have a dollar of a budget deficit, incomes have to, taxable incomes have to rise $5 to get it back. But if something has a small deficit and private incomes rise $4, that may be a good deal. So we can't just have just the budget. On the other hand, we have to be very careful to have a bunch of programs that generate large burdens into the future. It also depends on what the money is being used for. Franklin Roosevelt funded three quarters of World War II with debt. Now, that was a, a great investment, an hour in the world's safety and democracy. And with growth and some sensible reduction in spending relative to wartime levels, that, that uh, debt GDP ratio, which exceeded 100%, got back down to normal levels. And indeed, we've had some increases and decreases over the years. But before the Great Recession, we were at a debt GDP ratio of 37%. So it's doubled. So my answer is, very simply, I think the corporate side of the Trump tax cut was good. Was it perfect? Of course not. The personal side, I think, was done to try to get enough votes for the, the badly needed corporate side. Before the Trump tax cut, the US had the highest statutory tax rate of any country in the OECD. Now we're kind of just below the middle. Now, there are a variety of other changes as well, but I think the corporate side was good for growth and good for the economy, and I'm glad it passed. The personal side had a, some good things and some things that were you know, politically necessary to get it done. I myself would prefer a much broader base uh, to the personal income tax with far fewer exemptions and deductions. Yeah. We have a microphone. So two quick questions. Uh, with regards, I think you were in uh, President Bush Sr.'s administration. Do you think in hindsight that the 1990 budget agreement which raised marginal tax rates was a mistake? Because a lot of people, you seemed quite favorable towards the Trump tax reductions. And a lot of people, in the first Bush tax cuts in 01, but a lot of people think the uh, 1990 agreement did do a lot to bring the budget back into balance. And um, secondly, could you briefly explain why uh, some people state that the inflation rate might be overestimated because we tend to underestimate the quality, quality changes in goods? I've never understood how that has an effect on the actual price level, even if quality has improved. Okay. Okay. So first of all, yes, I was involved. I was chairman of President's Council of Economic Advisors in 1990. And I had helped him run for president, and my view is we ought to freeze spending with some variations across urgent needs. Okay? Uh, but President Bush confronted a large Democratic majorities in both houses. So I think in the end, he decided for three reasons that he had to have some sort of a budget agreement. One, that there was some concern that then would now seem modest, but then large deficits late in an economic expansion would be a problem. Secondly, that there, because the Berlin Wall had fallen, the Democrats who were controlling the House and Senate wanted large defense cuts, and he was very concerned about that. And I think that's the single biggest reason he went along with a modest tax increase. The third reason he was uh, interested in doing something is he wanted to get on to other things, and this was holding up a variety of things. So I think that it had a, 
a minor negative effect on the economy. Not, it's not irrelevant, but certainly it had an effect. The main reason we had a recession in 1990 before the budget agreement went into effect was quadrupling of oil prices and a variety of other things associated with more normal business cycle things and a credit crunch uh, associated with the savings and loans and money center banks having, uh, having big problems. So that's part one. Part two, um, maybe the easiest way to think about this is how many of you have been in, in a big box store, Walmart or Costco or something like that, or a big chain supermarket, et cetera, okay? So you walk in, how many separate products do you think there are in that store? Anybody have a guess? Shout it out. 10,000, that's a good guess. It's more like 60,000, okay? Now, that, sometimes that's different sizes of the same product, but over the course of a year, that 60,000 changes. A few thousand disappear, some new ones occur. Many of the others claim they're new and improved. Some are in an objective way. Computer processes are faster on the computers. Something's more energy efficient, et cetera. So in a dynamic economy, it's very hard to measure the exact same product all the time because some disappear, others are, and, and are replaced by something that's better. So the laptop you have in front of you is more powerful than uh, many, many computers a generation ago, and maybe originally as mainframes some long time ago. So if that computer costs $1,000 today and $1,000 five years from now, and it's twice as fast and enables you to do many other things, in some sense, you're getting a more product, something better and the price hasn't changed. So a big part of improved life, uh, life and standards of living are new and improved products. A good way to think about that, maybe when you if you remember this, uh, when you're headed back home, make a, make a list of some products you use and services you use every day that didn't exist when your parents were around, and then when your grandparents were, it'll flabbergast you, okay? So accounting for those things is difficult. Our statistical agencies try to, but it's hard and they're generally behind. So there's some generally thought to be some remaining new product and quality change bias in how we measure uh, a basket of goods and services because the basket's improving over time in general. Okay, is that clear? Yes, over here. So you said that many complain of uh, inequality and then say that if you look at the global context, yeah. then we see a reduction in inequality. But I'm confused why the global inequality trend has any implications on the domestic inequality concerns. You then say that there's a problem with the high marginal tax rate for the top 1% given their share of the income. And I don't understand why the ratio of share of adjusted income to marginal tax rate has any significance and how you can compare that ratio over vastly different population sizes and seemingly arbitrary percentile cutoffs. If anything, the numbers you gave seem to imply that we need, to, that we need a more progressive tax system, given that the top 1% has double the adjusted income share of the bottom 50. Okay, that was so long ago that I kind of forgot the first question. Let's get to that first. The implications oh, global, of the global, global versus national. Yeah. yeah, the only point I was trying to make, I'm not saying there's inequalities unimportant or something we should ignore. I happen to think most of the problem is getting people's incomes up, not the distribution, but in any event, uh, I don't think that inequality is something we, we should completely ignore. However, all I was saying is many of the reasons uh, where the apparent increase in inequality has occurred are common to many countries and to global factors. And so you have to pay attention to those to understand what's been happening. That was the purpose of my juxtaposing the global and national. On the marginal tax rates, I think it's well established in many studies, mine and many others, that high marginal tax rates are a problem. Now, the U.S. currently has the most progressive tax system, system in general, not just the income tax, in the OECD. We have a smaller public sector, but most of the other countries rely on far more regressive taxes, mainly a large value-added tax. So I think it's a bad idea to have very high marginal tax rates. In general, my, I have a bigger concern. I have a concern with high marginal tax rates on anybody, including people at the top. 
My biggest concern is on the likelihood, if we don't slow the growth of the uh, entitlement programs, some gradually and cumulatively over time, that those high marginal tax rates will affect a broad swath of the population. And I think that will be very destructive. Last question. OK, one more. OK, how about this young lady back here? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, one argument that I've heard is that the reason that certain jobs aren't able to be filled right now is because uh, marijuana is not legalized but used often um, <clears throat> by potential employees and thus the employers aren't able to hire them. Do you think that legalizing marijuana could have an effect on the economy? Okay. <laughs> Without getting into, I have no knowledge of how many people are having a trouble getting a job because of some something like they smoke marijuana. I have no idea if that's a very tiny number or a tiny number. It's not, it's not obviously not a large problem. A big part of the problem is that people are unable to do the necessary tasks at work. Uh, for some people, maybe this is related to opioids or other things more generally, probably not just to marijuana if, if that's an issue. Uh, it's problems just being dependable all the time. For others, it's the skills they have. They might have to have some very simple technical skills, be able to use, to do a little bit on a computer uh, to handle, to work in a factory, they have to handle some, some one piece of electronic equipment or something of that sort. So there are a variety of reasons why this is the case. More generally, on legalizing marijuana, which some, some states have done, et cetera, I have kind of mixed views. In general, we don't want drugs in general to wind up being a source of destabilization globally because Americans consume a lot cartels in Colombia or Mexico or somewhere else have immense power and we wind up having gangs distributing, et cetera. And we have a lot of crime associated with it. But I think the evidence on what's happened in places that have tried, um, tried to legalize or more broadly is mixed. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages. And um, I think also from what I'm told, I, Last time I had some marijuana, I was in college. Um, I'm told that it is far more potent now than it was when I was in college. Maybe, maybe you're all smarter and have thicker brains and it takes more, I don't know. So I, I have, you know, I, I really, I'm sympathetic to not having rigid controls, but I also wanna make sure we don't wind up having it spiral out of control. And how to do that balance, I think, is, is not an easy decision. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll stick around for the next question.